talk fast enough that we'll have time at the end for questions. Now, just to give you a uh, context, there's three professors here. I'm educational psychology at Penn State Harrisburg. Dr. Wilburn is math at Penn State Harrisburg, and Dr. Shapey is English at Penn State Harrisburg. Each one of us embedded um, technology into our courses, and so we, are, uh, we brought all our students, and we're going to kind of wind them up. And they're going to take off on um, some of the products that they've used and how they went about that. But before we begin, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of the context. You know, right away, all of us in this room will say, oh my goodness, we're a different generation from our college students, and our college students that are pre-service teachers are a di different generation from their students. And so we're really looking at a three-generational bridge that we have got to do in teacher education. And that's not necessarily looked at very um, cleanly or precisely. You know, we have your terms like digital settlers, digital immigrants, digital natives, and they go across the board. And you constantly have to pay attention to, hey, how many of you in this room right now went through K through 12 without internet? Come on, fess up. Yeah, look around, OK? Yeah, and so some of these students up here keep saying, those are your bosses, right? Right? And, and those are colleagues. So we have that generation. How many of you um, were on the internet before um, grade 12? See, we have, yeah, okay. How many of you were three years old when um, you were, had iPads in your hand? See, no one, but some of our kids are going to have that. And by the way, I always tell my students, most of your kids don't even, we're not alive at September 11th, right? Which is hard to remember, too. So we have to look at bridging the, um, bridging all the generations. And so we're looking, we know that effective teaching and learning is impacted by relationship and by constructivism. We know that's the case. How do we do that? Using technology and being sure we can bridge generations, bridge an understanding of technology use, how do we do that? And that's our main challenge. And in educational psychology, um, this will be our main um, kind of graphic. And I'm looking particularly at bridging, bridging theory right now because in bridging theory in educational psychology, we're always saying, hey, there's a lot of theory out there. How do we keep bridging it to practice? And I spent the summer going, there's got to be a better way. Because what happens is they sit in my class and they say, well, that's great theory. I don't know when I'll use it. Right? And then they go in the classroom and the teacher says to them, I never use those terms. Don't worry about it. Just get through the class. And you're like, wait a second. I, I'm passionate about learning theory. It, it, it informs everything we do. How can we bridge that. And so over the summer, I worked with um, Media Commons, and we got an iPad um, uh, grant to put mini iPads and have their own devices to bridge that gap between theory and practice. Because what I said was, hey, here's the deal. I, if they can see learning theory every place they walk, and um, Dr. Wilbur is going to talk about how if they see math every place they walk, <laughs> and Dr. Shapey is if they see English, right? Now we have it. So how can they capture that? And so what I did was say, okay, what if we capture it using iMovie? So I um, had them, them working in iMovie, and the assignment was, um, I want you to show me learning theory in your world. So you're going to hear from two students and how they did that. So Nate. 
Good morning. As Dr. Strickland said, uh, my name is Nate Trimmer, and I, we took our educational theory class with her this past fall. Uh, I'm currently student teaching, um, about halfway there, and yes, I'm counting down the days for that. Um, but when we got this assignment, uh, we had talked about all the theories in class, and we were trying to figure out how can I show her that I know what these theories are. We can talk about them all we want, but how can I show her? And what I decided to do was I coach uh, a high school team and a middle school team, and I figured the best way for me to do this is to watch some sort of sport and figure out how I can, I can diagram this process. And the pictures that you see up here, I immediately thought to the background that I had with, te with any technology that had to do with creating a video. Uh, I was uh, privileged in high school to have access to GarageBand, MacBooks, uh, at times iPads, iPods. Um, I have some familiar, ex some, some experience with making a documentary from my undergraduate studies at Millersville. Uh, but it really played a, a role in the process and the uh, beginning stages of how I wanted to tackle this assignment. So the first thing I did was I wanted to make a video that showed the learning theories I wanted to find an event that showed these learning theories. I didn't want to make a video that showed these learning theories. And, and there's a difference in, in what I mean by that. And what I, what I decided to do, you'll see the storyboard in the middle there. And I chose a local basketball game of a school that I work at. And I, I didn't go into it saying, I want to find this theory. I want to find that theory. I just videotaped a portion of the game. And I, when I went back and I said, oh, there's my theory. There's that theory. And you see some still frames from this. and. On our Padlet, or on our, our link for this uh, symposium, there's our videos on there uh, that Maddie will show you hers in a second. Uh, but there's still frames up there. And as the theory happened, I showed it. Okay, just visually popped up the, the words there, what the theory was, why this particular action fit, uh, and then went from there. And it allowed me to show her that I understood what I had learned rather than take an exam or just take a test on each individual theory. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Maddie, who had a completely different process uh, in this assignment than I did. All right, um, thank you, Nate. So when I got this assignment, um, I had a very different um, take on it. I actually had never used iMovie before. So for my professor to say, this much of your grade is based on this was a little bit of a shock, and I um, had almost a panic attack when I realized that I better get moving on this. Um, so from there, I um, first looked at where can I get help? How can I get someone to help me understand what iMovie is, first of all, and of course, how to use it and how to make it my own. Um, so from there, um, obviously I had no <coughs> previous experience. So I started with online tutors. Um, I found, found Linda through um, our Penn State um, website. We had a lot of help through that. Um, they showed me a lot of tutorials on how to use um, how to use images um, in your still frames in your movie, how to bring text in, how to cite works, um, and so on. So um, I also did a lot with my processes. As I had my feed of what I wanted to put in there, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it was a lot difficult to actually put what I saw in my video onto what I was trying to show others how I saw it. So there was a lot of experiment. Um, maybe this worked, maybe this didn't. Uh oh, I better try again. My grades, you know, my deadline's coming up, and of course, trial and error. So um, without further ado, I'll show you part of that works. We hope it works. Okay, you can plug your jump drive in and do it that way. Is your jump drive? No. Okay, so we'll show you the end if we have time. No, we'll have to show you the video at the end if we have time. It's this connection problem. Yeah. Well, take them through the frame. So Nate talked about the last Talk about your setting. Okay, um, so a little bit about me. I'm actually, I live on a dairy farm. So um, when I first got the assignment, I thought, um, how do I see learning theory on my, on my everyday life? So of course, I went home that weekend and I was milking cows and I started, I took a step back and I started looking at what they were doing. And um, our milking parlor is set up where um, the animals actually come in all by themselves, the door opens, 
They walk in, they go in their stall, which is open, the stall closes, we milk. Um, when they're done, they leave and go back to the barn. So right away I thought, operant condition. Oh my goodness, I had no idea that was there. <laughs> so um, my, my iMovie was based on looking at what the cows are doing and how did they know how to do that? Why did we do that? I mean, we don't physically write out, here's your explanation, you know, open door, go. They just do it. Um, and I also did a few other theories um, where um, I talked about um, expectancy value with our calves and how um, working with our calves, we can see um, if, they're, um, if they're doing well, like if they get to off to a good start, they're drinking, but what about those ones that are not? So um, I watched my dad work with our calves, and I noticed that as he had a high expect expectancy for the calves, that he knew that each of these animals could um, do well, could um, um, grow to mature cows that were productive on our farm, I could see that this is also translating there. Um, so those were two of the bigger bigger areas. And then, of course, there was um, your sister. Um, your sister. Oh, um, my, uh, one of the workers, other workers on our farm, she was milking, and I noticed um, that she, um, there's a lot of socioculture of, of what she was doing. Um, she <coughs> wanted to come to our farm. She had um, innate curiosity, and she wanted to learn. She wants to work with animals in the future, either um, vet tech or um, um, pre-vet, some medical biology field. And she came to our farm and started learning that way. Um, so I was watching her work, and I watched her take on our farm. Someone who had not come from a farming background come into our farm and say, what, what are they doing? How is this happening? And then I also looked, I compared her with um, my uncle, who was also milking, who's been milking for over 40 years, working with cows. And I compared what he does on our farm to what she does, how it is different, how it is similar. Why is she doing it that way? How did she learn it that way? Um, and so from there, I was able to take a whole new perspective on what she's doing. Um, I also did some on how she um, is working on our farm because, honestly, she wants to get money and she, for her car. And she also wants to continue um, working in the field and be more um, reliable on herself and not have to worry about her parents driving her. So there was a lot of um, taking a step back and looking at my farm in a totally different way. I mean, I've lived on my farm my entire life. I know a lot about our cows and I lo know what they're doing and what, what to do on the farm, but I had no idea so much learning theory could be taken um, in an everyday um, life like that. And then, of course, I try to explain it to my parents and they just look at me like, we're just milking cows, honey. No. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. But, um, but that's, that was my take on it. And from there, um, I think I really enjoyed it. And so looking back and saying, as I'm becoming a future teacher, um, I learned a lot about this, not just about iMovie, but about how to approach technology. Um, I had no previous experience, so maybe my students don't. Most likely they will. But it, there are some, like me, who have no idea. And so from that point is to learn to give them the resources. Don't, don't worry about just assigning a topic and saying, this is what you have to do, and I'm going to assume you know it. Um, walk through the steps with them. Give them the resources. Um, help them out. I know my resources helped me um, complete the project. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Shapey. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Fanny. We switch a little bit with me, if I could. Gotta love technology, right? Yep. There we go. All right. Um, I teach. Um, a class that actually Nate was in Martha's class and in my class and George and Hannah will come after me. This is an English methods class. So these candidates are um, typically in their seventh semester right before student teaching. When Hannah was with me, she was a little bit earlier in the process. So we are, we're at the end. Our piece of it is to look at authentic learning experiences for K-12 students. So the teacher preparation piece, we bridge what happens in higher ed with what they're about to do in the classroom with student teaching. The basic premise that I start with in the class, and there is a tremendous amount of flexibility for the students because they're finishing their program. They need to be the decision makers. They need to assess the tools that they have and use them appropriately with the students that they have in front of them. And who those students are will change. Those could be students that are milking on the farm. 
They could be students that are on the basketball court. So how do we take this, honey, we're just milking cows, into a higher ed classroom to see how we can make learning relevant for these students? So what we're looking at at the top in this cloud is what we know in higher ed that we have a multiliterate and multimodal world. We have students that are engaging in these activities every day, but yet somehow here on the left where you see the solid line, often in classrooms, regardless of the level, we have a valued sense of meaning making that creates a border or a boundary. So those real world multimodal experiences bounce right off. They don't seem to come in our doors. So when in English education, we actually have a little bit of a kick in the pants from our professional organizations because all of our standards changed. And I would imagine that for many people sitting in this room, when you look at your Canada preparation standards and your professional standards, that in the last, probably for some of us, it's eight years, for some a few, few, you know, maybe two or three, but the standards are changing about what we consider materials, what we consider text, how we, how we negotiate me in our classroom. So I ask my students to look at creating some sort of a permeable boundary. We're not changing the nature necessarily always of the reality in an English classroom that you be, need to be able to read a novel or that you need to be able to write an essay or that you need to be able to build an argument. We're not throwing that out. What we're saying is, how do we get to this learning? How do we position our K-12 students as valued knowers? So the challenge I gave to them was to look at how they can open secondary English instruction. How can they really challenge themselves to consider how they define <coughs> materials, modes, and perspectives? Critically think about how they value learners, how they define what a text is. Can a human being be a text? All right, we look at social engagement with learning, and we start from a premise that literacy and learning is ideologically situated. And now I'll turn it over to George. Thank you, Dr. Shady. Uh, yeah, my name's George Zarr, and I entered Penn State Harrisburg as a non-traditional, non-traditional 30-something uh, student. And um, what I mean by that is I had a background in uh, retail for 14 years, worked at a bookstore, and I also like to tinker with electronics and technology. And um, as a secondary English teacher candidate at uh, Penn State Harrisburg, I was asked to create a unit plan uh, by Dr. Shaby, which engages all students using, among other things, multimodality, multi, uh, multiple literacies, as well as technology. And at that time, or around that time, I had been reading a lot about uh, the NSA surveillance program in the news. And I had come across an article by a fellow named Corey Doctorow, who happened to be an author of a book called Little Brother. It might be hard to read, but Little Brother is the book that I chose to create my unit plan around. Part of the reason I used Little Brother was because it's a technology-intensive novel, which it's also award-winning young adult novel, I should say. But it's a technology-intensive novel, and what I mean by that is that it embeds technology learning within the actual novel itself. So in addition to being like kind of a thrilling plot and having highly relevant um, controversies in it, such as the NSA, um, it has this technology learning right in it. But it also has extension texts. Uh, it has extension text opportunities, I should say. And so you can pick out what you want within this unit plan to make room or make a space, like Dr. Shapey says, for lots of learners to come into the discussion. And additionally, the free book is offered, or the ebook is offered for free under a Creative Commons license. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Cory Doctorow, it's free. You can go out to the internet, find his website, download his ebooks for free. It's great. Okay, but like Dr. Shapey has said, and like Penn State Harrisburg teaches us, texts are more than print on paper. In fact, are more than print on a screen. Um, in fact, you might say, or one might say, that once upon a time, all text was nothing more than uh, paintings on cave walls. And so, you know, that's my segue into this. This is an extension text that I use in, uh, to open up a conversation about deconstruction theory. And, you know, it's an unfamiliar term for a lot of adolescents, but a, a brick wall or a cinder block wall like this is something very familiar to a lot of adolescents who come to, to come to class, and a lot of them who maybe uh, might not want to come to class. 
And so I present them with this image, which has actually been altered by, I used uh, GIMP, which is a free Photoshop-like software. So that's available for free. Um, I used that software to take away something from this image. But I asked people in the class, and I would ask you to you know, read, this, read this wall and, and respond to it and you know, consider what, you, what meaning you might put into that. And from there, I introduced them to Banksy, who is a well-known graffiti artist. If you haven't heard of him, look him up. You'll, there's a lot of engaging uh, commentary you can make about his work. And so I use this as a way to talk about deconstruction theory. And the reason I chose this piece and the graffiti artist is because I thought if I allow adolescence idols into my classroom, into my sanctuary, you know, I'm going to be able to provoke a conversation with them. They're going to have some space to come into that conversation of the overall unit. And so that would be a, a hollow victory for English education if I didn't otherwise connect it to some form of academic rigor like Dr. Shapey had said. So in this case, I would use binary oppositions uh, as a way to talk about this piece. We might talk about you know, the notion of flower and beauty versus the notion of being sick and vomiting. And you know, this can open up. You could take this in many different directions. Um, but the point is, is that, yeah, I was able to use this kind of technology, which is like Photoshop. I was able to use an image from the internet. And there's a lot of great Creative Commons uh, stuff you can find out there. If you didn't get to see Stevie Rocco's uh, session last hour, I recommend seeing her website for learning how to do that. But yeah, basically, this is what I used. And I would recommend, you know, find imagery out there for your students. If you can't, I'm sure you'll be able to find engaging content. And I'll move to Tim. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Hannah Mackay. I am also a non-traditional student at Penn State. I will be student teaching in the fall. And like George, I was confronted with the then unfamiliar task of putting together a unit plan for Dr. Shapey's English Methods course. And um, I was really enthusiastic and excited about bringing in perhaps my favorite canonized text, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. If you are unfamiliar with this science fiction novel, you should know that Fahrenheit 451 is the temperature at which paper burns. And in this novel, the fireman men's jobs are to start fires and burn books. So this is a highly controversial novel and it's made its way onto banned books lists countless times since its publication in 1953. Students really like that when they get to read something <laughs> iffy, you know. Um, so when writing my unit, I kept two uh, main ideas at the forefront of my mind. One is that learning is a social process. And the other is that the definition of literacy is evolving and expanding. Therefore, my discipline as an English teacher is also evolving and expanding. So research shows that our adolescent digital natives are spending much of their time outside of school interacting with technology, primarily through social networking sites. And in an attempt to bridge students' home and school literacies, I aim to uh, utilize digital collaborative spaces to foster idea sharing and collaboration among students in my class. Um, so this particular Padlet is situated at the very beginning of my unit within a lesson on um, figurative language. And this novel, Fahrenheit 451, is just riddled with beautiful imagery and figurative language that students really need to understand in order to grasp um, meaning. Um, so I use the application Padlet throughout, and let me see what's going on. Excuse me, sorry, we've had so many technical issues this morning, my goodness. Um, but I use a Padlet throughout because it's basically a digital bulletin board where students can really simply um, insert their ideas and then upload any associated links, videos, or photographs, and they can do it from any device. So Padlet's available as an app for smartphones and uh, tablets. And um, the website is also available uh, simply off of a computer or laptop. Um, now, while I was putting my unit together, I had to keep reminding myself that I can't make assumptions that all of my students are technologically savvy, because that's just not true. Um, 
But Padlet is perfect because it's essentially a scaffold that allows easy access to a digital collaborative space regardless of students' background or experience with technology. So I use Padlet throughout this particular unit as a way to facilitate discussion and to also open up that collaborative space um, because I think that it better prepares our students for our increasingly uh, technological and globalized marketplace. I'm Jane Wilburn. I teach the secondary math methods course. And if you know, um, in today's classrooms, uh, teaching mathematics requires lots of engagement and lots of constructivists in order to get students to understand what they're doing in a math class. So part of our goal in the secondary math methods course is to look at the combination of taking the content of the classroom the pedagogy and the technology that's available, and how do we interact those two? What's the complex interplay of those three different areas? And in the methods course, looking at each piece of those particular um, circles up there, and how do they uh, interact? How do you, as a teacher, work to make sure your students are learning? What pedagogical skills are you using to make that work the best? How, what technology are you using, and how do you use the technology effectively? So we want to look at the use of technology to not only help students learn mathematics, but help them to make mathematical connections, help them to be able to think critically in a mathematics classroom. Um, several of the different types of technologies that we use, we use a lot of graphing calculators and some with uh, computer algebra systems. We use GeoGebra, Geometer Sketchpad. We use uh, Google SketchUp. We use uh, a lot of virtual manipulatives, some Excel. Uh, I use Doceri a lot in my teaching, which is kind of frustrating to me right now because we couldn't get it working here because I could be right here on my iPad and I could be writing on things and it could show up on the, on the screen. Uh, but how does all of that work and how do we help our future teachers learn to use technology so that they're facilitating a technology-rich discussion, they're helping their students construct their knowledge, uh, they're managing the student learning as they're working, as all the students are working with the technology, and how do they help to, or how do we assess our students as they're using the technology to learn the mathematics? So uh, we integrate that TPEC framework a lot throughout the course. It's sort of our guiding conceptual map. Um, and one of the assignments that we give, or I give in the course, is that they have to create a technology-rich lesson for secondary mathematics classroom where the students are required to actively engage and construct their knowledge of a mathematical concept. So Candace is here, and she's going to share with you the lesson that she created for this particular assignment. Thank you. Right. Yes, I'm Candace Heller. Um, I am a traditional student at Penn State Harrisburg, and I'm currently doing my student teaching at a high school. Um, and. Our assignment was to come up with an activity um, for a high school geometry classroom. Um, and we were given the guidelines that we were supposed to either use GeoGebra or Geometer Sketchpad. And I opted to use GeoGebra because it's free versus the um, paid version of Geometer Sketchpad. It's also available in multiple ways. You can get it as an app, you can download it, or you can access it online. Um, so I started with that. I got a textbook that had some resources for um, some traditional activities with pencil and paper, and I tried to modify that to something students would be able to use with technology. Um, and I started to focus on the content that I chose. So the activity I chose had to deal with um, reflections and translations. And from there, I started to think about what was involved with that that I could share with my students to get them to understand the knowledge the same way that I do. Um, collaboration, I started talking with my classmate um, who was working on the project with me. And we were able to consider different learning styles while we were going through it because we both um, access the information in different ways and were able to figure out how to get to the same endpoint with different processes. So talking about that gave us different ways of presenting it, different guidelines to use for the activity. So we decided to create a guided activity rather than uh, step one, do this, step two, do this, which um, just told them, you need to construct this shape, how you do it. You, works out however you would like. Um, from there, we practiced doing it in multiple different ways so that we could anticipate what the students would be doing to be able to help them. And then 
Um, before presenting it, we had to rehearse with the technology that we had. Um, so rehearse with Doceri, or I use Splashtop, which is the Android version of the app. And then um, from there, for the class that I had, we did the translation project. Um, within my student teaching, I also did <coughs> two other projects for a ninth and 10th grade geometry class that had to do with polygons. Um, and throughout that, I learned that the best part for the guided activities is to just give the students guidelines to let them explore because although I tried seven different ways to do my polygon thing, one of the students still came up with a different way of doing it, which <laughs> was pretty impressive. He got a bonus point for that. Um, so it's definitely good to let these kids interact with it. And they got really excited about it and were exploring it on their own. A couple of them downloaded the app on their iPads for class and were using it for other things as well. Um, so it's definitely beneficial to have it, even though there are going to be difficulties like we've been experiencing today, or like I had in my class when I realized you can't use a touch screen when you have chalk on your fingers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's better to rehearse and be prepared for those and work through those, and the students will see you come out from that and um, will realize the benefits in using technology and will get excited about learning. Thanks. So you may have heard some themes and some ways of um, interacting with technology in three different disciplines. And just um, we'd like to just uh, do two things. When we're talking about connecting, I wanted to introduce you to two books. You may know them already. One of them is The App Generation from Howard Gardner. And you just want just some provocative quotes at the end here. We live in an era when individuals can study or attempt to acquire skill when they want to at a pace of their own selection alone or with others. And you heard how we did that. We did that with facilitating our students and then the students facilitating their students. And we, we strongly encourage you to um, be involved in that process. And um, uh, the Born Digital is the second book. Both of these references are on Padlet. So we, we saw you had some comments already posted. We're glad for that. Can we pull up the Padlet on here? Um, and we'd love to have questions while he's pulling that up. Any questions that you have? And you can interact. Our students probably are better experts at this than we are. But feel free. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, I have a question for the teacher educators and anybody in the room. But an observation I have is that we call them digital natives and they come into us as students. I work in agricultural teacher education. My name is Daniel Walter. That's why we were happy to hear about the data farm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, as I try to prepare these students and young teachers to go forth and work with students in the classroom, what I discover is when I went through the university, they required us to take a course called Microcomputer Applications, <laughs> um, learning how to do stuff in Word. And so they keep telling me they're digital natives, but I'm constantly shocked by the lack of digital skills they have. They can push a button, they can like something, but they don't know how to insert a photo or a movie into PowerPoint. <laughs> they don't know how to do certain things. So where are we teaching them these technical skills, the background, on this technology? Yeah. I mean, what is the comment to that? I guess that's not a very good question. Sure. Yeah, yeah. we have five minutes. So I, I hear you. Okay, so I think all of us have some comments. I'll give one sentence, and you have a comment. Go for it. We actually, and, and this actually pairs with Dr. Shapey's class that she mentioned that I had with her uh, in developing a unit for an English uh, classroom, and it works well with schools that are tech savvy. And unfortunately, the school that I'm student teaching at, they aren't afforded quite the opportunities are that I was when I was in high school. But what I established in my lesson was using the resources within the school planning a, a day or two uh, before you do a cumulative project, a, sum, a summative project like this, where you get a technology teacher to come in and walk through with them. And then day two, go out on your own. And then day three, have that same technology, te technology teacher come back. Excuse me. And by that point, the students are going to have questions about, I can do this, but I still can't do that, and why? Uh, so, so they're multi-literate, and they live in a multimodal world, but that doesn't mean they're multi-literate yeah. in the same thing. Yeah. So this whole idea that we get sucked into with digital natives yeah. is a dangerous trap. Yeah. They know how to use a game controller, but they don't know how to use the enter key on a keyboard. But some do, and that's what, why we gave the whole span here, you know, because poor Matt, Maddie was like, oh no. Okay, but here's one of the issues that I think all of us are trying to say, and that is, do we resource them and do we use our experts? Um, Maddie found experts in her class. You find experts in your class. And everyone has different questions, so to pr 
provide a, a static training, I don't see as helpful in a fluid environment. However, to facilitate resources online and with people, I find to be incredibly <coughs> helpful in giving that space, like you were saying, to do that both at all levels. Because we as professors need that too, and we're constantly doing that. So, I mean, it's a, it demands a bigger answer, and I think it's something we have to stay aware of, right? We have to keep asking that question, and we should never make an assumption on what they know or don't know. Instead, we should say, what do you know, who's the experts, and how do we pair you up to get the job done? And where do you need to go? Yeah. You know, where are they, what, what are we really talking about with college and career readiness? What are we talking about with, with uh, post-secondary education? So we need to open those pathways. Yeah, if they know where to get the resources, great, right? Instead of giving the training, can we um, resource them and show how to find the resources? And I think like um, Mr. Pink said, if you backpedal a little and give them the question, why? Why are we learning Windows versus Linux? Or you know, why are we doing this word processing program versus another? If we backpedal a little bit, then we might be able to give them more of a, a, a bedrock foundation that they can branch out to whatever their specialty you know, may be. Other questions? Here's your chance to have these students appear. <laughs> so sometimes we learn from our students, and I think that's what we're really talking about is how we learn from our students. And, you know, we love to, like, sit in there, and, and we all, I mean, to, so all of us need to be honest. We have a sense of control as teachers. You know, we're educators. You have to have some sense of where things are going. But part of this process is opening ourselves up to what our students might bring into it. And what Hannah did with Padlet has opened up an opportunity for the class that we'll have next week. And she taught me about a technology that works for her with social learning. And so now I'm using that technology in this adolescent literature class next Tuesday at Penn State. And our students will be confronting issues of social justice on a Padlet page that I've uploaded with FBI links and video content and nonprofit sources. So that's part of what we're doing. All right. Thank you very much. And um, we're here for a few minutes, and we'll be around. So thank you for your engagement, and have a great day.